How's it going folks? We're up here at Owen's place today to check out a very awesome and impressive aquaponics system. We're going to hop inside and start checking out the system from the fish tanks and then we'll finish out here with the grow beds and the sand beds behind me. Where to begin is the, uh, <laughs> is the interesting question. Yep. Uh, basically, I wouldn't say this is 100% an aquaponics system. Uh, it's more of an aquaculture system with the bonus of fruit and veg coming off it. Mine's geared up to produce fish and a lot of them. Uh, what I have is three tanks. In a normal growing scenario, I have a fingerling tank. I have a medium sized tank for the medium sized fish and then I have the grow out tank. So what I'll do is I'll cycle the fingerlings in. They'll eventually get moved into the mid sized tank and then new fingerlings will come in. And then the, when the middle ones grow, they go into the grow out tank. So basically it's always rotating. So you always have fish. What I bank on is a hundred fish in every tank um, at any one time. So you'll have a hundred fingerlings, a hundred medium size and a hundred ready to eat. It's a little bit out of whack at the moment because I did a rebuild at Christmas. So I've had to basically start again on the sizes. So just to get me up to speed a bit quicker and a bit more productive, I have the barramundi in the fingerling tank, which will soon be moving the, to the grow out tank. It's just by the time I'd finished building, stocks of fingerlings and that were well out. So I had to had to, had to do what I could do to get it productive again. And um, you were saying that these guys have been in there for three months? These guys are only three months old. Uh, when I got them, they were fingerlings from three to five centimetres. Yep. Most of them being about the three centimetres. I did a check on them last weekend and they range from 20 to 30 centimetres now and anywhere from 100 to 300 grams already. For our hot, warmer climate, they're like basically our trout. Yeah, basically, if, um, if you can get them at a good size at summer, which can be hard every year to do, hence why I hate it, this tank at the moment, you can grow them out to a decent size in the three, five months if you've got really hot weather. Otherwise, it's the Jade Perch, which are nearly bulletproof. No heating, a little bit more longer weight than these guys. These guys, in the same time, will come out double to triple the weight you'll get out of a Jade Perch but you have a lot more waste from them as well, so. And just, um, we'll just talk quickly about keeping these guys warm because we are in our winter here. Yep. Just very briefly, explain your setup, if okay. you could. During the day, I run it off an electric heater. My house has 72 solar panels, so basically electricity's free during the day. Yep. So during the day, I run two heaters that are 2,500 watts total. So one's 1500, the other one over here is a thousand. Excuse me, fishies. So those two heat the tank during the day. And then at night time, because electricity's gone through the roof, I came up with the idea to use a camp heater. A camp heater's basically a gas hot water system that's portable. I've got an Inkbird controller, so it detects when the temperature's too low Yep. and fires up the pump which then pumps it through the hot water system it comes out of the hot water system through a coil of stainless steel and back into the barrel again where the pump is so it's basically a closed loop heating system and that way you don't get any of the nasty copper or anything like that out of the heater not a problem and just to point out um, Owen is a sparky by trade yeah, that's why it looks like a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why you can also do this. Um, the average backyarder, um, maybe seek a professional to do it for you. Then everyone says, oh, you're going to gas yourself in the shed. Uh, basically what I've got is an overhead ductwork that pulls all the nasties out and goes to an exhaust fan on the side of the shed there and it pumps it all outside. So when the heater turns on, so does the exhaust fan. Yep and all the gas and everything gets pumped outside. Uh, I've got a carbon monoxide alarm there that I've never set off with the system. Uh, I have with a couple of cars though, once or twice. And you were saying you've also got it, um, the, the back to base um, 
Fire smoke. alarms yeah. and uh, smoke, smoke detectors. detectors. So you're, you're yeah. pretty much all covered in case something goes pear shaped. Yeah, I've got the two smoke alarms, one here, one at the entry to the shed, yep. and they connect with one at my house. Yep. So if anything goes wrong in here, I know. What temp do you run your barrow at? Mine I run at 25, only to slow down the growth rate because they're growing too fast for this time of year. But 28, if you have them in water that's 28 degrees, the things will double over three weeks. So your pH range for the barra, because they're such heavy poo producers, it's running a little bit lower than the rest of the system. Just in case the ammonia does spike a little bit, I don't run into huge issues. It's not going to be an issue with all the biomedia in it, but I hate losing fish. <laughs> oh, don't blame me. And what about the other tanks? What do they run at on uh, average? These ones are all running at 6.7. 6.7, yeah. So even 6.5 really in the scheme of things isn't that low. Of course, we need some bio biofiltration for all of this. So we've got the grow beds outside, but you've also got standalone biofilters for every tank. Yes. Um, because this is a fingerling tank and I don't want to introduce any diseases or anything like that when they first come in, this tank can be fully shut off and it's got the two biofilters on it which keep the fish nice and happy. And I like that you're also using those socks. Uh, yeah, I bought these filter socks, they're proper aquaculture ones and they'll filter anything down to 200 microns. They do a bit of heavy lifting, so I don't have to run more of the mechanical filtration than anything. Also too, I like using them because I can throw them in the washing machine. Yep. And I've got a washing machine in the shed and I do that once a week and I can feed my other fruit trees that are outside the shed. So nothing's going to waste basically. No. Everything's staying within your system, your property as a system. So this is your, your medium stage grow out. What yeah. have you got in here at the moment man? Eel-tailed catfish and jade perch are in there at the moment. Uh, it's a bit of a hodgepodge because the eel tails take about three times as long as the jades before you'll get something decent eating out of it. They're just slow growing and they'll clean out the tank for you a bit too. So I just add them in because they're really good chewing, but they take forever to grow. And I also noticed that in these two um, tanks, you've got pumps uh, running in each pump, uh, in each tank. Keep in mind people that, as uh, Owen said, this is basically an aquaculture system that is adapted to grow plants with. Uh, so these pumps here, they feed directly into your bio. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so the fingerling tank, it has its own two. That's that one there and this one over here we saw before. Uh, the medium tank, it has, well, it shares, it's got its own there and it shares the big boy with the grow out tank. And this is one mammoth, mammoth biofilter, folks. How much media is in this big IBC one? Uh, 700 litres. So you were saying all up you've got around about 1,000 litres, is it, worth of biofiltration? Yeah, separate there, to the grow beds? Yeah, there's a 1,000 litres of K1 in the system as it stands. That's more than enough biofiltration for these three tanks alone. Uh, for anyone who's concerned about um, yeah, issues of biofiltration. No, this will do... I think it's one litre for every... 500 grams of fish. That's about right, yeah. So if you do the maths on that, I've got a thousand litres. I can have as many fish as the heart desires, really. I'd actually run into problems with aeration before I'd run into pr problems with the biofiltration. So there, there is a, a lot of um, pumping involved in this system with the air as well, as you've seen. But then again, it's you can never have too much air, can you? No, see, what I've done is Basically, I like to cover bases. One thing does two things at once. So I've got a pump, it'll do a biofilter, plus it will also do the fish tank. Not that that one's in, chuck it back in. That'll help. <laughs> yeah, that'll help a little bit. But I'm getting that much that comes through the biofilter anyway. Yeah. The big one has got that much air going into it. I could probably turn these off and not be too worried about it. Um, this one here, as you can see, it's got the three air pumps going to it. Uh, it only needs two to run, but because I run such a load, large load of fish, uh, I run the three. So if one does break down, I've got the peace of mind that, you know, I'm up, not up late at night worrying about, are my fish still alive? Yeah. With this system, basically everything goes back to the sump eventually. The sump's outside. 
Uh, the sump feeds up into all the fish tanks. There's a pump out here that pumps to there. Uh, all of it has the capability and does flow to the sump outside. Fresh water comes in from the sump, goes through the fish tank, through the filters, then back to the sump. The big tank, it's slightly different because I added the sand beds in. Uh, so I changed how that flowed so I could feed the sand beds the fish poo. Right at the end there. Right at the end. What happens is the water flows out of here, goes through a radial flow filter, which there's a pump in the bottom of, and it's on a timer. What it does every two hours it is the pump turns on and it flows it out to the sand beds and takes pretty much all the poo that the big tank produces out to it. Not a problem and we'll have a look at those sand beds in a moment. This one being it's got medium sized fish in it it goes through the large biofilter yep. through the smaller biofilter and then flows down and out to the sump as well. So that's why you're basically relying on all the socks everywhere. They're doing the heavy lifting where it comes to the solids for those tanks. For the smaller tanks, the socks are the key. Yeah. The big tank, the radial flow filter does the heavy lifting. Go and have a look outside. Yeah. So the sump tank, there's a uh, there's a couple of red claw and some yabbies in there. They clean up the little leftover bits and pieces. They're on the menu at Christmas, so I put them in at the start of the year and at the end of the year, pull them out of the sup. They go on the Christmas dinner list. So you were saying as well that um, having them all labeled actually helps you when it comes to um, monitoring flow rates? Yeah, because I've got such a hodgepodge of beds, everything's got to flow at a different rate. So to keep everything simple, I can just lift up the top of the sump and I can see what bed's flowing, how fast, and then I can adjust them all accordingly. For every bed, there's a tap yep. all the way down the line. Um, same with the sand beds, they got a tap on them just so it doesn't flow too fast and disturb the sand. And you've also got a little satellite power board. Yeah, this is a temporary board. Yep. Uh, builders use them uh, as temporary power usually when they're building your house. Uh, Sometimes they'll hang it on your house afterwards and that becomes your main board, but a lot of times they put a temporary one in that you can just plug in. So it goes over to the power point on the side of the shed yep. and basically feeds the business end of town. So what I've got in here is the power for the two pumps. One pump pumps the water to all the fish tanks inside the other pump pumps all the water to the grow beds, but not the sand beds, the sand beds come out of the radial flow. Um, the grow beds outside are on the timer, which is here, just so I can turn them off at night because it saves me two degrees loss at night, which is a pretty big thing when you've got barra in the, yes. they, uh, they like it warm, anything below 18, you're gonna have lots of issues. Also too, the air pump's housed in here, which feeds down and out and goes to all the floating raft. I've noticed you've got a couple of um, different growing methods, uh, predominantly raft for what looks like a cos or romaine lettuce. That's cos lettuce. Um, not that you'd think by the size of me, but we love salads. Pretty much I rotate uh, the lettuce over and over. Uh, I don't let them grow to maturity. I'm, I just like the high turnover that you have. Um, so pretty much I can do about a hundred lettuce at once in three different stages. So I've got the larger ones that I eat, they're not real large at the moment because we've had all the rain and I've had to rejig everything yet again. Hence why there's a lot of snow peas floating around here and there because I've been using the snow pea leaves instead oh, okay. of the lettuce leaves. Yep. So you can, you add them to your lettuce, gives it a little bit extra flavour and it buffers out your lack of greens. lack of greens if you're in the situation I was. So basically I start off at the front where it's more protected from the sun and all the seedlings go in there and then I move them up as they get bigger and bigger. And then when they're not much bigger than this, I usually start taking them. These ones here are growing out to seed so I'm letting them go, but you can see I've been greedy and picked a few bits off. 
when they when they look good in the salad they go and you were saying you want to save um, seeds from these guys because they just did exceptionally well for you yeah these ones were in a batch that did really really well even though i've sort of maimed them quite a bit by taking all the leaves off it uh, i want to seed them out so because they just grew so well i uh, might as well save the seeds and do a batch yeah and over here you've got a couple of uh just are those soil bags uh yeah they're the front and back of the root pouches yeah. um basically the bottom of it bottom half of it is filled with sand uh pearlite and vermiculite these ones have in it okay. yeah. uh just to add a little bit of extra air because this is what i call a swamp bed this one it basically does a few different jobs it holds my more long-term plants um, it always provides water and I've got a ton of duckweed in there which I feed to the chickens oh, okay. the chickens love the duckweed the fish will eat it if they're hungry enough but it's not their favorite so these one here it's not too dissimilar to your bathtub you've got in a way dual root zone these ones just have sand in the bottom just enough to cover where the water level is and then dirt on top um, these couple have potatoes in them they've only just recently been done and there was a capsicum over there that didn't really like the floating raft so right. I've just chucked it in there for now um, basically I'm gearing up for when it gets a bit warmer in a month or two so I'll have my tomatoes going the sand beds what everyone oh, yeah. wants to know about ah uh, yes the love-hate relationship we all have with these things yes um, basically I put it in it, there's you know we've had the long going argument over you know whether they're good they're bad yeah. um, from a growing point of view they're good yeah. um, it basically gives you a lot lot more ease in planning uh, things seem to grow really well in them but they are a bit of a pain in the bum <laughs> um, but oh, I don't know over, overall they are a benefit they you should add them to a system i'm not saying make your whole system sand but they're definitely a good addition to a system yeah, my my main um, takeaway is exactly what you you're doing with yours using it for somewhere to deposit your solids waste pretty much it uh just gives me that little bit extra time um, because i originally had the filter socks on the large tank and with a big load of fish you are changing filter socks over and over it just becomes a chore hence why i rebuilt the system uh, to incorporate these so this way pretty much the majority of the waste goes into this bed and i never really have to look at it you know i, I don't have to touch the waste i'm not running a mineralization tank that's another job you don't have to do yeah. on saturday yeah it's another job you don't have to do so do you find you get a lot of muck on the bed or does it disappear no it disappears pretty quickly it um i don't know whether it's the sun or the water or a mixture of things with the plants but yeah it breaks down very rapidly and these are the inlets for the actual beds themselves yep what you generally find with a lot of sand beds not all of them but some work fine that the water coming in will washes the sand away a great use of the pouch there just to help you know break the water flow up a bit this basically directs it otherwise you end up with this big fissure here yep. and then when it stops filling with water the sand rolls back in on itself so your furrows are always falling at the end yep. uh, by doing this it just directs the water straight in and gives it a nice flow around everything that way you don't lose the sides of the bed i suppose we should talk about the drainage at the other end so i've seen online that people do a lot of um, rock filters around their the outlets so you didn't worry about this one's just a straight shade cloth yeah this one's just a straight shade cloth uh, the first time around i did do all that i started off i did the standpipe then i went geofabric then i put the shade cloth over the geo fabric followed by 40 mil stones then 20 mil stones then 10 yeah. mil and then you know on and on until i was up to a sand kind of thing yeah. uh, after putting it all together and watching it i realized i didn't need all that okay. so i just this one is basically a standpipe with a bit of shade cloth cable tied that's around it. it that's it there's and both of them still filter fine this one goes a bit quicker because it hasn't got the geo fabric and that on it oh really okay so, yeah if you just go a piece of shade cloth wrapped around it twice that's all you need to do excellent
So basically your sand beds are acting as your as your solids waste filter and your mineralization tank. So it, it does the heavy lifting on that side and it's one less chore to do. Also biofiltration and somewhere to plant some pretty nice looking carrots. These are baby carrots. I've probably left some of them too long. Yeah. Um, I didn't thin it out originally. Oh, there we go. There's there we a go. there's a baby carrot in inverted commas. That's a nice looking carrot. Yeah. Then the pouches in the middle. I'm running a test at the moment. So what I've done is I've seeded the pouches and the sand bed at the same time with the same things. Okay. So I want to see whether things will grow a bit quicker in the dual root zone yep. compared into the sand itself. I've done the snow peas over there. Uh, this is snow peas here. At the moment, the sand bed's winning with the snow peas. Yep. Uh, the radishes, they were planted at the same time. I dare say these radishes are slightly winning yep. in the race so far. And then I've got a few lettuce seeds I put in there too. And the lettuce is slightly beating the, the soil as well. Yes. Unless you have a crack, you're not going to know, are you? Well, that's it. And also, too, because of the size of the bed, um, I could have could have gone three furrows in it, but with the size fish tank and the amount of fish I stock, I need the extra gap in there yeah. to allow for all the water flow and the fish waste. Uh, then I sat there and I looked at this nice big gap, and I'm like, well, there's a waste of... A waste of area, I might as well chuck these root pouches in and... See how you go. Away it goes. And as you can see from the other ones that went in earlier, which I haven't thinned out yet, but it's on the list. <laughs> <laughs> Always on the list. Yeah, everything's on the list. So what, we've got some um, broccoli in there? Yeah, they're late season broccoli oh, okay. and cauliflower there. I'll probably just have them smaller than usual. I just wanted to see how they do. Yep. Um, the cabbages are looking okay. Yeah, yeah, the cabbages are taking off. They've actually taken over too soon because I've got a few. Oh, okay. Yeah, see that one's split. It's been in there too long. Yeah. But uh, this one's due to come out. So, yeah, that one's split too. So. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Yeah, oh, just left them in too long. That's the only thing. Yeah. you got to be real careful with your root growing stuff. Here we go. Here's one. There's a nice one. Yeah, there's a nice one. And over the back there, that's obviously a passion fruit. That's a passion fruit. Um, because this section of it in summer, it is just glaringly hot. Uh, usually I run a big shade cloth over the top of this, but I thought two birds, one stone. Yeah. I like passion fruit, so may as well grow one up and over, provide a little bit of shade. Yep. Uh, if it gets too far, I'll just thin it out. But yeah, I can have the passion fruit growing over the top then. And that's a lemon over in the corner? Uh, that one's actually a mandarin. Mandarin? Oh, okay. Yeah. That's what I asked you the other day and you said that. <laughs> so obviously with all these fish, you will be harvesting them. Uh, do you want to tell us how you clean them up? Oh, hang on. Put you in frame. <laughs> that's all right. This year, I have a 500 litre, it used to be a rainwater tank. Uh, I've repurposed it. It's now my purge tank. Uh, there's a couple of family members I have that don't like the plain taste of freshwater fish. Uh, so I find I can salt up this tank and purge the fish that are ready to eat in it for a few days and it just gives them that little bit of a salty flavour, gets rid of any you know other flavours you may get from feeding commercial feed. Yeah, and it just makes it that nice crisp clean taste with a little bit of salt for people that don't like freshwater fish. And it's basically just a recycled rainwater tank, you put a pond liner in, a pond sealant. Uh, yeah, it was an old rainwater tank from outside. It had sat outside a shed for years upon years. Um, even though it only had rainwater through it, I just wanted to seal it up just so it's 100% for food. Um, I don't think the makers of these tanks had them food grade back when these were made. Okay. So I just put the sealer in there just to make 100% and that yeah. I wasn't poisoning everyone. That's fair enough. And I remember you actually painting the outside during one of our um, supporter hangouts. That yeah. was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. See, I, uh, I like to listen, but I like to do as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so um, Owen has come along every now and then and um, given us a bit of a tour as he's doing work in here during the hangout. So it's been great just seeing little bits and pieces being added and the expansion. Do you reckon it'll go much bigger? Um, if anything, I'd probably capitalize on the vegetable side of things. Okay. 100 fish every 
four months is pretty much enough for my family. Yep. My family's getting smaller, not bigger. We used to have five kids at home. I'm down to one now. 100 fish for three people every four months is enough to get you by. It'd be greedy, if anything, if I, if I went bigger. Yeah, I could eat fish every night, but who wants to eat the same thing every night? Yeah, too? exactly. So, yeah. If anything, I'd probably extend the garden out to the fence. Yeah, and you were saying you were interested in trying one of Hucho's um, grow boxes. Yeah, Hucho has those grow boxes. Um, basically, it, it, it's like a small raised bed uh, that's filled with a pond liner, and then you put the gravel on top of that, and you have a little float valve in there which lets the water in and make sure your plants always have water and then you put the grow bags in there and do it that way I wouldn't mind putting the system up so it powers up one of Hucho's ideas. So it's basically will end up being a uh, dual root zone almost? Pretty much, yeah. uh, there's a fair bit of dual root zone in here. Yeah. Um, I found it's pretty much the way to go. Uh, aquaponics is pretty closed minded when it comes to how things should be. Everyone has manuals that yeah. were written eight years ago based on 20 year ago ideas. Um, I think we need to evolve a bit and just take bits from here and there and make it all one. You know, the more productive you can make a small space, the better it is. Yeah, exactly. So once more, thank you very much to Owen for inviting us along here today. Uh, it's been a real education just seeing how he's got the aquaculture side of the system set up. Very impressive indeed. And do keep in mind that this started off as an aquaculture system and he tried to make it more sustainable by utilizing the waste to grow veg. And that's why we've got the bit of a hybrid grow situation going on outside of the shed here. And as always, thank you very much to those folks who come along every week and thumb up the videos and leave a comment or just a g'day in in the comment section down below. Love chatting with you down there. Thank you very much to everyone who's supporting the channel as well by buying the Backyard Aquaponics Beginner's Guide. I'm having a ball helping you folks out. Thanks as well to you folks supporting us on the different membership pages, the YouTube one and also our patron based one, Farm Your Own Yard. Thanks for the support folks. So we'll pretty much all leave it there. I'll let Owen get back to his weekend. I do hope you're all having a fantastic one and your gardens and aquaponics is booming and I'll catch you next video. Cheers folks and happy growing.